It's the growing season, and probably one of the worst times of the year for the metal detectorist. Much of our permission is either covered in four feet of wheat or four feet of grass is being grown for hay, and far from the optimal conditions for detecting. So naturally we find ourselves following the sheep. They are living, breathing lawnmowers after all. But I guess the question is, is there really much point coming out when the fields are slim and the odds are very much against us? Join us on this adventure to find out. Welcome back, it's Lucy and Ellie from Roman Found. And we're back up on the hillside pasture. The sheep have just left this one and it's beautifully short. Last time we were up here, we found a Celtic and some Romans, so fingers crossed for something ancient today. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting back in that ancient spot. So what is the worst time of year for metal detecting? Well, the answer will vary depending on what detectorist you ask. Some will say winter, some will say summer. The ground's too hard, it's too cold, it's too hot. It seems there really is no right time. For us, the growing season is the most frustrating. There's nothing like going out and finding all your permission undetectable, scrounging around in the fringes like a desperate addict. But what none of those detectorists will tell you is that when the conditions are tough and the odds are truly against you, this hobby can be the most rewarding. It can surprise you, force you to learn about these fields that you never would have chosen to go into. First signal of the day, Little 10 11, which is a hopeful sign. Oh, you can hear something. But oh no. Foil. Foil. <laughs> Maybe not Trash. a good start to the day. Little <laughs> 9 10. Okay, what do you think we've got here, oh, Ellie? I think we might have a little something, look. It's just a little edge I can see there, peeking. Can you see it? Oh, yeah. You think it's a coin? What is it? Button. Oh, I think it's a button. It's a shiny one, that one. Oh, look at yeah. That. First proper find. First proper find. Ooh. Big, shiny tombat button. Look at that. And I've just picked up a sing uh, another signal quite close, so I'd be quite curious if that's... Another button or not. Let's have a little look. First find of a diglet. Yeah. There you go. Little button. So this is the other signal right next to this other hole that Ellie's just closing up. Whatever it is, what it's in my got? hands. So what do you think it's going to be? It's going to be button number two or something more interesting? I hope it's going to be something more interesting. Is it lead? Oh. Bit of lead? Looks like lead. A little bit of lead, look. Bit of activity at least. So we've made it, this is our destination. This is last time we were in here, we discovered this was a little ancient zone. We had some Celtic, we had some Roman, we had a lovely rose farthing. So, let's see what comes up here. Good little ten here, sounds quite good. Let's see what it is. Looks like we've got our first coin. Definitely a little coin lurking there, isn't it? Look. Come on. It's really thin. Little nail sixpence, look. What, like a... S and then that should be, I imagine, Lizzie on that Lizzie, side. Lizzie, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Ooh, first coin. coin of the day. Shall we see what date we've got? Yeah. See the lovely... Thistle, clover, rose design. What date is it? It's looking like 62 from here. There's Lizzie. There's Liz. Have you heard of Mary Gillick? You might not know the name, but you will be very familiar with her work. For Mary is the woman who modelled this iconic and revolutionary portrait of Queen Elizabeth II. I talked and the Queen talked and I got her into my mind and I was anxious if possible to get more than just that charming profile. 
1952, the young queen sat down to have her profile immortalised for the very first time onto British currency. It was the start of a new era, and the woman sat in front of her was 71-year-old Mary Gillick, a professional artist and talented sculptor who previously had always been in the shadow of her late husband. The public excitement for the new monarch was feverish. The Royal Mint had held a limited and secret competition to decide the new portrait artist, and once announced, Gillick found herself in a spotlight of the world's press. Very solid 9, 10, quite close to that um, sixpence. Right, it's just here. I think, I'd say chances are pretty likely there's another coin. What is that, a coin spot, do you think? Oh, look. There's another one, is that another sixpence? What we've got? Look, in, look another sixpence, look. Oh, wow, two. Double sixpence. I mean, they're meant to be lucky. Maybe our day's coming up. I mean, they're quite close next to each other. It's pretty much to the next to each other, look. Right, have another look. Lovely. So what date have we got on this one, Ellie? From here, it's looking like 1953. Gillick had already had a career that had spanned over 40 years. She had studied at the Royal College of Art under the famed sculptor Edward Lantery. She had sculpted medals showing an airman who shot down a zeppelin over England during the First World War and prominent suffragette Ida Wiley. But this was her greatest challenge yet. Her design breathes the air of the early Renaissance, yet is distinctively modern. It draws upon the portrait medals of Pisanello, a 15th century Italian painter who had achieved perfection with his work. It's both nostalgic and youthful, created with a deep understanding of both modern Britain and legacy, stylistically commenting on a time when royalty was an integral part of public life. What, putting them together? <laughs> Double sixpences. Hopefully luck. Lucky sixpence and all that. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yeah, a 12 here, just to see what that might be. The triple sixpence? <laughs> a third sixpence. No, a little bit different in the signal. Is it going to be anything exciting? Is that it there? Is it a lump of... Is it a lump of trash? <laughs> Is, Is it lead? It's a strange strip of lead. Yeah. Mm, curious. Strange. It's quite a big piece. It's quite a big piece, actually. What are we making with that? Yeah, this one doesn't sound too bad. 15, 16, quite solid. Ooh. Oh, oh, what's that look? Oh. Uh, just sit uh, a little strap in, sit a little mount, a little piece of copper. Fitting of some sort, yeah, look. some sort of fitting. Got a little hole on one side, mm. maybe a hole on the other. Curious. Okay, a copper fitting. Yeah. There we go. A little bit of activity at least. Very nice. Lovely. Eleven, twelve. Quite consistent. What have we got here, Ellie? I think we've got a little Ooh. button there. Lovely one. That's a nice one. It's got some ace to it from the shape, I think. Yeah, quite unusual. Because this dome shape is much... It's older than the flat ones we find. Yeah. So a little bit of older activity coming up, look. Maybe focus a little bit more round here. Look at the shine on her. Yeah, very solid 20. See what that's going to be. Hopefully a penny. It's just on the edge of there, so let's see if we can flick it out, shall we? What do you think it is? A penny? Hopefully something interesting. Ooh. Oh, what is that? Jesus. Uh, a bit of farm machinery. Don't know. Trash is what that is. Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> Not exciting. Very good sounding 15. Oh, I see oh, something. Flat. It's been very round. Is it a button or a coin? Is it a button or coin? Ooh, button. Butter. There we go. A different type of button. Our third type of button for the day. <laughs> Looking like a four hole button oh, yeah. to me. Bit of 19th century. 
Third button of the day. Third button of the day. I think we've got a little bit of 17th, 18th and 19th. With two sixpences, you'd think we'd be due some luck, but buttons and trash seem to be plaguing us. Hopefully our luck changes after some lunch. It's Tudor England, and times are not great for the economy. Inflation combined with poor harvest and an explosion in population have led to crippling poverty across the country. That and for centuries, the Royal Mint simply haven't been making enough small change. Very strong signal. What have we got down here? A little something lurking in here, look. What's this? With button or coin? I don't know, is it looking their tokeny? Oh. It's not quite their tokeny, actually. Yeah, actually, it could be right there. Should we get a closer look at it? Yeah, let's give it a clean. It's looking very lead tokeny. Yeah, definitely. Is it just plain? Mm. Oh, oh, look at that! Let's say like go. It's got text on it. <laughs> oh, have we ever Is found it a one? With text GD before? or GO? Uh, it's looking like GO. Have we ever found one with text? Do you remember on that high one? Oh yeah, we did find one that said hi, didn't we? Okay. Oh, that's <laughs> so go. cool. What a brilliant find. That's definitely got some age to it. The smallest denomination of official currency that you could get your hands on was a silver farthing. But this was still a significantly high portion of the average weekly wage. Local communities found themselves in this situation where simple essentials such as a loaf of bread were worth less than the smallest change they could get their hands on. So how on earth were you meant to pay for it? The only options were to accept payments in kind, run up a credit with the shopkeepers, or to introduce your own small change. So that's exactly what they did, creating these lead tokens to fill the small change gap. They are found in a wide variety of designs, but today we can only guess at their meaning. Initials like this one are a pretty common occurrence, thought to relate to the issue of the tokens, perhaps a farmer paying his workers. In these small rural communities, more and more people were working for wages and this unique and local sub-currency was essential to keep the cogs of daily living turning. Little go! <laughs> <laughs> so cool. If you're enjoying this video, then be sure to like and subscribe and support our channel. So, just as we found that lovely lead token and we're thinking, hmm, hit a bit of patch, we've just noticed that we're about to be flooded by about 200 sheep. <laughs> <laughs> the farmer's doing some moving around, yeah, isn't it? so I think we're going to move fields. Well, let's go and check out whatever field they've just left behind. Don't know if I'm quite vibing up here. Yeah, but the sheep, when we parked up the car, the sheep were in one of our favourite fields, so hopefully they're no longer in there. <laughs> let's go check it out. Recently vacated field. Now we've just changed swap fields with the sheep. And honestly, I don't think it could be any shorter. No, I'm hoping this gives us some good signals. Absolutely, we've had hammers out of here, we've had all sorts out of here. We've even had Celtics out of here, haven't we? So, maybe the afternoon's taking a turn for the bear. Good 20s, interesting signal. Looks like we've got a coin. Five minutes in the new field and we found a coin. Ooh, is oh, it a... That's a big guy, that one. Huge penny. Oh, wow. Wow. Is that 18 or is it? Is it Victoria? Is it Victoria I'm or George? Sure. Who do you think we've got? Should we have a little look? Yeah. What a beast. Oh, I see 18. Oh, I see 18. Have we got Vicky? Oh, it looks in lovely condition, you know. It's definitely 18. Young-haired Vicky. Oh, it's wow. bunny. Bun-haired Vicky. That's lovely. Oh, beautiful. Oh, that's so cool. It's not often we find a bun-haired Vicky. Not no. in as nice condition as this. Hello, new field. I know. I think good vibes in here. Good vibes. This Victorian bun penny is a milestone in British coinage. It marks a shift from copper to bronze for small change and could be found in circulation for almost a century. In 1838, Britain finally achieved something it had been struggling to do for nearly 2,000 years, mint enough small change that there wasn't a coinage crisis. 
Just 22 years later and the copper coins they'd worked so hard to bring to the public's pockets were on the way out. Copper was heavy, wore out easily, stained fingers when it got damp and gave off a bad egg smell that wasn't appreciated by the Victorians. There was also an international problem. At this time, Australia was Britain's primary supply of copper, and the miners were thoroughly distracted by the gold rush, driving the copper prices up. Bronze, on the other hand, was lighter, cheaper to turn to coins and more hard-wearing, a fact reinforced by Victorian pennies of the 1860s still turning up in circulation in the 1960s. So enter the bum penny, first minted in 1860 a new bronze way forward for British coinage, and an iconic portrait of Queen Victoria that was described in the contemporary press as an especially truthful likeness. Dating from 1893, this penny is one of the last examples of this flattering portrait, still in good condition even after decades of the ground. Nice big coin! It's <laughs> one of those big old pennies. Not quite sure about this one, sort of jumpy 20s, but maybe worth a look. So very deep down here, look how deep it is. That's crazy. We have got a penny. Is it another Victorian one, do you think? Oh, could, could, could be. Another penny, it's deep clay down here. Yeah. Like really deep clay. It's really lucky. Yeah. Ooh. That's Vicky, look. It's our second Vicky. Looks like a different second portrait. Vicky. Older portrait. Her, yeah, her old, is it her, called her widow portrait? Where she's wearing her veil, look. Oh, yeah. So we've got a year. Oh, yeah. 1896, look. A couple of years after the one we found before. Lovely. Lovely one penny. Good condition as well. The soil's doing it well, look. Yeah, really good. <laughs> really lovely. So nice. That was a funnier signal, that one. Yeah, Maybe because it was, really it was deep, so deep. Yeah. Absolutely stunning, that. Finding a penny in Victorian England could have quite literally been the difference between life and death. At this time, Britain found itself experiencing both amazing luxury and utterly devastating poverty. The empire was at its height, the Industrial Revolution was firing Britain into the modern age, the population had tripled, yet there were simply not enough resources to go around. In London alone, there were 30,000 homeless children. Living on the streets was a tough and dangerous time, the winters were freezing and crime flourished, but of course this destitution provided a lucrative business opportunity. For the price of a penny, a homeless person could pay to sit up on a bench all night in a hall. For two penny, you could sleep quite literally hanging over a rope. And if you were lucky to have four pennies, then you could afford to stay in a coffin house, one of the first homeless shelters in Victorian London, which offered small cramped wooden box beds that alarmingly resembled coffins. Neither choices sound like comfort, but for many they were the only option when faced with the alternative of freezing to death on the streets. Funny 12, 13, worth having a look at. So it's right there, and I think I can see it just peeking out from the bottom of the Yeah, floor. there's a little something there, isn't there? There's a little artifact. What's that, look? Hmm, curious. It's that little chap. Ooh, see that's it? looking more interesting. It's looking very interesting. We need to clean that up. Yeah. Is it like a brooch? <gasps> what is it? Is it? Let's have a look. It looks delicate. It looks very delicate. So, what have we got here? I'm not really sure. I've got actually no idea what this is as well. I think it's one to clean at home because it's looking very... So delicate. Very delicate and fragile. I'm not sure what it is. It's almost got like a ring. Yeah, it's like a ring attached. It's like it's like it's holding a ring. And then there's definitely a hole in this end, like some kind of fastening. Yeah, it's not some type of like... Not like a, you almost want to say like a purse hanger, but not. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It looks old, yeah, I think. Yeah, definitely. One to research. A curio. Very intriguing. Very intriguing. Quite lovely. So many small artefacts like this one would have been lost to obscurity if it wasn't for medieval art. They may not have realised at the time, but their sculptures, paintings and stained glass are all valuable records that have quite literally painted a picture into medieval dress, domestic artefacts and society. 
So thanks to medieval art, we now know that this is a pendant mount, a specialised type of bar mount that would have been attached to either a waist or sword belt in pairs to allow a purse or knife to be suspended from the loops. The leather straps would have likely been covered in evenly spaced bar mounts that would have to some extent strengthened them and protected them from damage, but it is likely that their main purpose would have been for decoration. Yeah, good little 12 right on the surface. Let's see if Ellie can hear it with the pinpointer. I can hear it. It's not very deep at all. What is it, Ellie? Look, it's a spoon. What? Look. That's such a good signal for a spoon. I've got the hiccups. There's a whole spoon, look. Oh. <laughs> look at that. Bent, entirely whole spoon. That's so funny. Let's meet the Cowans, a local Sheffield family who carried on the historic tradition that the city was built upon. This is, of course, the craft of a cutler, a knife, weapon and cutlery making practice that was first recorded in Sheffield in 1297 AD. This city's prosperity was built by the cutlers, and it's even believed that the victors of the Battle of Bosworth were armed with Sheffield arrows. And this humble spoon, stamped A1 Cowans, is one of the highest quality stainless steel items to come out of the city in the early 1900s. So who are the Cowans? Well, James Cowan and Sons was started around the 1860s by a James Cowan, son of a cutler Henry and with two young sons of his own, George and James, that he was keen to pass down the family tradition. It was the Industrial Revolution and Sheffield was the steel centre of the world, but building a cutler business was hard. Long-standing firms such as the Royal Cutlers Joseph Roger and Sons had already been going for over a century, and low safety regulations in cutler workshops meant that the disease silicosis was rife. James Jr. didn't last long and soon left to run a beer house, whilst James Cowan and Sons faced several liquidations. George, however, took on the baton and began G.H. Cowan's, a new firm under his name. The Cowan's lasted in business for almost 60 years, just one of the many families who have been part of this historic craft that has been renowned in Sheffield for over 700 years. That was a little 10, 11, 12 here. Oh... Ooh, I see something Ooh, in there. What's that? Is that an, an artifact? I think it's an artifact. I'm just going to take the gloves off so I can know okay. a little bit better. An artifact? What is it? What is it? Just hmm. a bit of. I'd say it's like a decorative piece of buckle plate. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's. it's uh, yeah, because look, that's where the strap would have gone in, and then there should be another half to this. Oh, interesting. So I think it's possibly a fragment of decorative buckle plate. Oh, that's good, a little artifact. Yeah, that's quite a smash, that. A little artifact. Yet another medieval artifact making an appearance, a small buckle plate that would have added an element of strength to one of the most dependable and important dress accessories of the medieval period, the belt buckle. With all these small artifacts, surely a coin can't be too far away. Little odds and sods in there. Odds and sods tin. Ooh, 20, 21, 22. Very strong. Is it a shiny coin? I think it's a shiny coin there. It's a shiny penny. Shiny penny. Oh, look. wow. <laughs> Is that a Georgie? I think so. Looking like a Georgie. Lovely colour on this one, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's almost like really red. That would be Britannia on that side. Beautiful. Love, love these big pennies. Oh, wow, the colour's so nice. Such a good colour. 1921, look. It's really ready, isn't it? It's a really rich... Almost purple. -y. Yeah, I was about to say almost purple. It's almost purple, look. Really shiny. Yeah. <laughs> if you didn't know it wasn't meant to be this colour. <laughs> really lovely patina and condition. Beautiful patina, honestly, it's really nice. I have one of my, my favourite patinas for a big old penny. Yeah, it's sort of very unusual. You don't often find them that colour. Very 
very solid tan. Haven't really had one of those much today. So, whatever it is, it's in Ellie's hand. Well, it's come out in quite an exciting little lump. Shall we? <laughs> Pick it apart so it looks good. Thinking. Oh! Oh, what's that look? Is it looking like a hammered? Oh, or melt? Like no, it's looking like a hammered. Hammered? I think, I think it hammered. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. What have we got? Ooh, I think it's definitely a hammered. Oh, yeah. Let's give it a little clue, shall we see if there's it's any like detail. A cross? It's like a Yeah, I'm thinking a long cross. Long cross? I think we need to get the spritz on it, don't we? Spritz on it. It's been quite heavily clipped, isn't it? Yeah, massively. Massively. Oh, clipped. exciting. I don't know if there's much. I don't think there's much detail on no. it, actually. Might be a tricky one to identify, but it's definitely. I can see pellets, I can see a cross. Yeah. Oh, it's very off centre, look. Oh, wow, wow. Wow, well, look, there you go really off center you can see there's a little bit of a legend appearing on the edge yeah definitely I'm not How sure if there's too much going on on the other side it's really like it's either heavily clipped or struck off I think I, both i think someone's been a bit naughty and done a bit of clipping you might have known that there was a mint at york but did you know there were actually two this is a medieval silver penny minted in York. It's distinguished by a hollow quatrefoil in the centre of its reverse cross, pretty much the only indicator that it hasn't been minted in the Tower of London, the mint that made the majority of the country's coins for over 500 years. A huge volume of silver emerged from York in the medieval period. It was the main northern centre for the distribution of money, the only mint in the region and had been minting coins since the 7th century but there were actually two different establishments within its mint, one belonging to the king and the other to the archbishop. Both of the mints operated throughout the medieval period, and they produced the same coins, but there was one difference between them. The archbishop's mint was much more consistently active, producing mainly pennies and marked them with the quatrefoil. And there might not be much else to go on with our coin, but we do now know a little piece of its story, minted at York under the archbishop with the profits of its creation going back into the city, and not to the crown. Always happy to see a Howard. It brings me a little bit of joy when we bring one of these home. There's a little bit of detail on it. A lovely little bit of detail. And the clipping in itself tells such a sweet little story as well. Yeah, so pleased with that. Beautiful. Made the dig. Woohoo! There we go. Faint 9-10. Yeah, about there. What have we got in the hole? What do you think we've got? See anything yet? Not yet. It's a bit shrill. There's a little something. Is it a coin? I think we've got another coin. Is it a, I'd like say a... it's going to be, it's looking milled. Is it another sixpence? Is it another <laughs> sixpence? It's looking quite like it, actually. <laughs> Is that a third there? of the day? It might be. It could be. Triple sixpence. Let's have a look. <laughs> the humble sixpence was the only old money to actually survive decimalisation. In 1971, Britain radically changed its currency system of pound, shilling and pence, a system that had been functioning in society for over 2,000 years. Decimal Day it was called, and on Monday the 15th of February, the old money was demonetised, and a new currency flooded the market. But one coin earned itself a stay of execution. The sixpence, possibly one of Britain's most popular coins, with a history intertwined with superstition and tradition. After decimal day, it was given the value of two and a half new pence. It was the only coin that didn't have a decimal equivalent. They must have been bringing us that look after all that. Woohoo! It's been a very coin day today. I love a coin day. And also happened to be the exact price of a phone call at a phone box. So it stuck around a bit longer, bringing a few more people some luck. It's a full tin. What's that, Ellie? I like seeing a full tin. <laughs> <laughs> and our sixpence has certainly brought us plenty of luck today. Fondly appearing as our last find, we've had a day of artefacts, history, and even some medieval silver. Maybe the superstition of the lucky sixpence is true after all. If you'd like to come on another adventure with us, then check out this video. Thanks for watching.